Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel, I'm Chris. So this was a request, Battle of Varna, 1444, Ottoman Civil War, Crusade Documentary, or... I had to. Okay, let's get into it. In our previous video in our series on the Ottomans, we covered the Battle of Ankara between Bayezid and Timur. As the speed of the Ottoman conquest ramped up, the resistance against them grew stronger. At the same time, internal strife would continue to alter the history of this empire. Welcome to a video covering the results of both of these pressures as we explain the Ottoman Interregnum and the Crusade of Varna. The Ottoman Empire was dealt its first decisive blow at the Battle of Ankara of 1402. The new conqueror, Timur, defeated the Sultan Bayezid I and took him prisoner. The Sultan's oldest son, Suleiman, managed to escape to Europe using ships from Venice and Genoa. Timur chased Suleiman to the coast, but he didn't have a navy, so an attack on the Ottoman territory in Europe wasn't possible. Instead, to punish the Christians for ferrying Suleiman, he captured the stronghold of Smyrna and executed its hospitaller garrison. Wow. Timur then restored the Turkic Beyliks in southern and eastern Anatolia, but his enemies in Iraq took Baghdad, so he had to leave the region. This was the start of the Ottoman Interregnum period, as sons of Bayezid attempted to consolidate their power. Suleiman was able to take control of the European holdings, but his forces were still weak, and the fact that one of Bayezid's strongest vassals, Stefan Lazarevich, gained independence after the Battle of Tripoli didn't help. In early 1403, Suleiman decided that he needed to negotiate with the neighbouring Christian realms. The Treaty of Gallipoli confirmed the peace between Suleiman and the Hospitallers, Venice, Genoa and the Byzantine Empire. The Greeks stopped paying tribute and received a number of coastal areas in the Balkans. Suleiman also promised to help Byzantium in the event of Timur attacking it. This treaty was full of other concessions by the Ottoman prince, but it gave him a chance to bring Anatolia under his authority. Meanwhile, Bayezid passed away in captivity. His other son, Musa, was allowed to return to Anatolia. Musa took control of Bursa and nearby lands as a vassal of Timur. Another Ottoman prince, Mehmet, was granted Amasia as his domain by Timur. One more son of Bayezid. Mehmed sounds familiar. I guess I'll find out, but I want to say that he ruled the Ottoman for a while, or the name, the name rings a bell at least. Bayezid, Issa, joined the struggle and attacked Musa. Despite early setbacks, Issa managed to defeat his brother in 1403. Musa found refuge in the court of Mehmed, who moved against Issa in the same year, beat him at the Battle of Ulubad, and took Bursa. In 1404, Suleiman finally launched his invasion of Anatolia, and initially it was successful. He conquered Bursa, then Ankara, but he failed to take Amasia, and in 1409, Mehmed sent Musa with a strong army to attack Suleiman's European domains. He was forced to return to the Balkans. In 1410, Suleiman defeated Musa at the Battle of Cosmedon. Although it seems that the troops were not happy with Suleiman, and in 1411, they defected to Musa, who killed his brother and became the ruler of the region. At this point, Musa rebelled against Mehmet, and in 1412 besieged Constantinople, as Emperor Manuel II was an ally of Suleiman. The Emperor asked for Mehmet's assistance, and the Ottoman prince crossed into Europe and aided in the defence of the city against his brother. Finally, Musa was repelled, and in 1413, Mehmed, supported by Stefan Lazarevich and Manuel II, won the Battle of Kamurlu in modern-day Bulgaria. Musa was executed, and the Ottoman Civil War came to an end. Mehmed I became the Sultan, and in the next decade reconquered some lost territories in Anatolia and took parts of Albania. 
His son Murad II's reign began in 1421 with rebellion. One more son of Bayezid, Mustafa, appeared, and as he was supported by the Byzantines, he was able to take control of the European holdings and declare himself Sultan. However, Mustafa's attack on Anatolia failed, and in the same year he was executed. Murad proceeded to siege Constantinople, but another rebellion, this time led by his younger brother Mustafa and supported by the Turkic Beylix, forced him to move back to Asia Minor. The Sultan defeated the uprising and annexed some of the Beyliks. In 1424, Murad forced the Byzantines to return the territory ceded to them according to the Treaty of Gallipoli and start paying tribute once again. The Sultan then forced the Albanian lord John Castriot to accept his suzerainty. A number of raids were conducted into modern-day Croatia and Romania, and he also took even more lands in Anatolia. With the death of the despot of Serbia, Stefan Lazarevic, in 1427, the Ottomans and Hungary started fighting over his territory. Parts of Serbia were devastated, but eventually it was established as a buffer region between the two states, with Jurad Brankovic at its helm. The plague of 1428 to 1429 halted Ottoman movement, but in 1430 the conquest was restarted. Strategically crucial Thessalonica and Ionina were occupied. As the King of Hungary, Sigismund, passed away in 1437 without leaving an heir, the Ottoman attacks intensified and by the end of 1439, Murad took Smederevo and Serbia became part of his domain. After a period of uncertainty, the King of Poland, Vladislaus III, was crowned the King of Hungary. The Ottoman invasions were worrisome for the leaders of Europe. An alliance began forming around Vladislaus, and he was supported by the church. Vladislaus and his commander, John Hinyadi, managed to win a few battles against the Ottomans in 1441 and 1442. At the beginning of 1443, Pope Eugene IV called for a crusade, and Vladislaus was joined by Durad Brankovic, Prince of Wallachia, Mercia II, and Prince of Bulgaria, Frusin. They had around 40,000 troops, and together moved against Nish. The fortress was besieged and then conquered, and three Ottoman armies that arrived in the area were defeated. Wow. One significant result of these battles around Nish was that Albanian lord George Castriot, who would later be known as Skanderbeg, deserted the Ottomans. He would resist the Ottomans for the next three decades. Why did he leave? Why did he just up and go? I tell you what, this Murad seems to win. But when he's not involved at the fight, it doesn't look like his people win. <laughs> Despite their defeats at Nish, the Ottomans still had an army nearby, this time under the direct command of the Sultan Murad. The Crusaders approached his position near Zlatisa, but were defeated. Fortunately for the Crusaders, in the beginning of 1444 at Konovika, they were able to win a battle against a smaller Ottoman army that was chasing them. Both sides were exhausted. Is Murad just... is he a really good leader? Because... or do... I bet his people probably have more confidence in him than maybe some of the other commanders. Because you're fighting for the guy there. I don't know. And although the papal emissaries were against it, a tentative peace was signed. Serbia was to be restored as a buffer state, the Ottomans were to pay war indemnity, and Hungary promised not to cross the Danube. The Ottomans used this peace to pacify Anatolia once again, and Murad felt that his borders were now secured. He abdicated the throne to his son Mehmet. Back in Europe, local Ottoman lords attempted to mount a punitive attack against Skanderbeg in the June of 1444, but the latter outmaneuvered them at the Battle of Torviol, and the Ottomans lost at least 10,000 troops. It is not clear if it was due to this defeat, or the influence of the Pope, or the abdication of Murad, but Vladislaus broke the peace and restarted his crusade in the autumn of 1444. 
Sultan Mehmed was just 12 at the time. We don't know if he was influenced by his advisors or thought of this himself, but he demanded that his father return to the throne. The letter from Mehmed to Murad reads, If you are the Sultan, come and lead the armies. If I am the Sultan, I order you to come and lead the armies. <laughs> the crusading army was moving towards the Black Sea this time around, as support from the Venetian and Genoan navies was expected. Nicopolis was taken, and by November 8th the Crusaders were near Varna. Murad indeed took command of the Ottoman army and approached Varna from the west the next day. The Crusaders were now blocked and had to fight. The battle took place on November 10th, 1444. The numbers of combatants are still debated, as the Western and Ottoman sources present entirely different estimates. Modern historians conclude that both armies had at least 20 to 25,000 troops. That sounds more realistic than what I was expecting him to say. Oh, you know, this group had about 150,000 and this group had 75 to 250,000. You're just like, what? Where are you getting these figures? Who counted? And how many times did they count? But yeah, that's this is a little more realistic than I would say. But perfect timing, I guess, for, all... for an ad. No one cares. Shut up. Shut your face. Another ad? Well, I mean, I like the cup. But I don't like your attitude, sir. I'm not interested in drinking your mud water. Where's how come the button has to be invisible? Peace o garbage. Really? Really? You want me to The Crusaders deployed their army between the Franga Hill and Lake Varna, with Polish and Hungarian forces in the center, Wallachians in reserve, German mercenaries and Bosnians on the right, and Transylvania. Just a uh, side note, there's a really small town named Varna that's not too far away from me. <laughs> Banians, Bulgarians and Czechs on the left. Meanwhile, the Ottoman center, which consisted of Janissaries and Azeps, mounted two burial mounds and set up barricades to their front. The right wing was manned by Sipahi cavalry from Europe. The left was made of Sipahis from Anatolia and Akinjis were positioned on the extreme left. The battle started with an attack from the Ottoman left, but it was repulsed and the Crusader right chased the enemy. However, it was an ambush, and the Akinjis managed to attack the Crusaders from the flank. The Crusader right retreated in disarray. The Ottomans attempted to crush the left flank of the enemy, but they were stopped, and Hunyadi went on to counterattack here. He succeeded, and the right side of the Sultan's army also retreated. At this point in the battle, King Vladislaus moved his center forward with hopes of killing or capturing Murad. The details are not clear, but it seems that initially, Polish and Hungarian knights successfully drove the Azaps away. They were met by the Janissaries next, and that clash decided the outcome of the battle when Vladislaus was killed by one of Murad's guards. Hunyadi also attacked the Ottoman center to retrieve the corpse of his king, but these efforts failed. The Ottoman right and left encircled the Crusaders, and Hunyadi had to retreat. Almost the entire Crusader army was lost. The Ottomans had won against another crusade, and the road to Constantinople was now open. Thanks for watching our documentary on the Ottoman Interregnum and. That was a very one sided fight. I mean, it looked decent. But yeah, that that turned rather quickly. I didn't understand why the Crusader, like they, there was a first attack, and then it got pushed back, then they attacked here, and then he came through. And I can't judge what he what his military numbers were, but it didn't look like he had the same numbers. Now you know you have you have horse um, horse. It's not what I'm trying to say. 
horsemen. You have guys on horses with swords, and they, you know, try to kill people. So I don't, you know, I'm pretty sure that is a little advantage. Um, unless they take the horse out. Then you're just a guy with a sword. Hmm. Yeah, that, that turned rather fast. But, hey. I'm going to end it here. Like and subscribe. Until next time, have a good day, have a good night.